Ivy's Journal Background During the 1900s, millions of African-American families left their homes in the South to live in other parts of the United States. This movement became known as the Great Migration. The first wave happened from 1916 into the 1920s. The second wave took place between 1910 and 1970. Over time, about 6 million African Americans travelled to cities in the North, Midwest and West to find better jobs and better schools, and to escape unfair laws. Ivy's Journal is a fictionalised account of one such family of migrants. May 2nd Today is my 12th birthday. When Mama called me for dinner, I found a present waiting for me at the table. It was wrapped in old newspaper, and I wondered what it could be. Mama, Daddy, my 15-year-old sister Mary, and my 9-year-old brother Buck sang Happy Birthday, then urged me to open my gift. I tore off the newspaper to find this journal that I'm writing in now. I was surprised to get a present at all, because Daddy had told us not to expect anything for our birthdays this year. Our farm is struggling, and money is tight. I don't know how my parents found a way to buy the journal, but I'm so grateful that they did. After we ate, I went to the room I share with my sister and brother. I opened the journal and wrote my name on the inside cover, Ivy Mitchell. Below that, I added the year, 1942. Then, I pulled out an old shoebox I kept under my bed. It holds all the things I love most in the world. A bright white pebble, a dried red rose pressed flat, and an old-fashioned hair comb. Beside them was a photograph of me in front of the schoolhouse. For a moment, I stared at the black and white image of a brown-skinned girl with braids in pigtails. Then I put some glue on the back of the photo and pressed it inside the journal below my name. There, I said to myself, that's a good start. May 11th. Today is the first day of planting season. My family has a small farm in Mississippi, and I spent the day with my parents and siblings ploughing the field and planting cotton seeds. By October, the plants will have bloomed and the cotton will be ready to harvest. We all help out on our farm, even Buck. Days like today, we have to skip school to plant seeds or pick cotton. I don't like skipping school, because if I miss too many classes, it's hard to keep up. But I don't have a choice, because there's no one to work on the farm but us. That's because we're sharecroppers. A white businessman named Mr Greenfield owns the land that we live on, and we pay rent by giving him a large percentage of our crop. Mr Greenfield also runs a store in town where we get everything we need for the farm, like seeds, fertilizer and tools. We also owe him for that, and it's hard to grow enough cotton to pay for everything. I once heard Mama whisper to Daddy, we can never get out from under this debt if he piles on more and more each year. I'm crossing my fingers that we have a good crop this year. May 18th. I got soaking wet walking home from school today. I was with my best friend Eve when it started to rain. At first it was just a few drops, but then buckets of rain began to fall from the sky. Eve and I broke into a run to get home as fast as we could. But my school is far away, and it's a long walk there and back. There's another school that's much closer. It's only half a mile from home. But Eve and I are not allowed to go there. Only white children can attend that school. We go to a school for Negro children that's another mile and a half away from where we both live. The school for white children is not only closer, it's also nicer. It doesn't have a hole in the roof like my school does. Each student has his or her own books too. At my school we have to share, and Eve and I sit together so we can pass a set of math, science, reading and history books back and forth or read over each other's shoulders. That's how the world works here in Mississippi. 
we live with segregation, which is a system that's set up to keep white people apart from black people. There are separate schools, separate bathrooms, even separate water fountains. At the movies or restaurants, black people have to sit in a separate section. There are some places that we're not allowed to go into at all, like certain hotels or libraries. It's like that all over the South because of a set of laws that people call Jim Crow. Mama says that Jim Crow is a way to keep black people from having the same opportunities that white people do. I wish that we didn't have to live this way. I only want to have the same rights as other kids. June 22nd Mr Greenfield stopped by the farm today to see how this year's crop is coming along. He gave Daddy a bill for everything that we owe so far this season. It was added to the money that we still owe from last year. Even though we had a good crop last year, it was not enough to cover the entire debt. Mr Greenfield makes me nervous. He frowns a lot and is disrespectful to us. He talks to Mama and Daddy like they are children. I saw Daddy's jaw tighten as Mr Greenfield said, You'd better pay off all your bills this year, boy. I won't stand for any laziness on one of my farms. It's not right for Mr Greenfield to say such things. He knows we work hard and are not the least bit lazy. He also knows that my siblings and I miss school to take care of the farm while his son and daughter get to go to school every day. I could tell Daddy was trying not to answer angrily because men like Mr Greenfield sometimes hurt Negroes for talking back. Last year a black man in our town was beaten for accidentally bumping into a white man in the street. The South can be a very, very hard place for black people to live. July 13th As I was washing the dishes after dinner, Daddy sat at the kitchen table going over our bills. I know he wishes he could find a job other than being a sharecropper. People who work in stores and factories in our area can make good money, but those places refuse to hire Negro workers. It's another part of the discrimination that we face. So many black people are stuck working on small farms and facing a mountain of debt. Everything depends on this new crop, I heard Daddy mutter to himself. It's the only thing that will save us. September 22nd Today we got a letter from Mama's brother, Uncle Eugene. He used to be a sharecropper like us, but he left Mississippi not long ago when the bills got too high. At the beginning of the year, he took a train all the way out west and moved to a city called Los Angeles in California. I couldn't imagine travelling so far away, or leaving my friends and family behind, but Uncle Eugene felt he had no other choice. In his letter, he told us that he found a job at a factory that builds airplanes. The planes will help carry supplies and soldiers for the war effort. He says that the factories need a lot of workers, so women and Negroes have the chance to get good jobs. Wow! They hire Negroes to work in factories there? I asked. California sure sounds different from Mississippi, Buck said, and we all chuckled. September 28th Today, in school, we talked about people like my uncle Eugene. I learned that many, many Negroes have been leaving the South for years now. They leave to find better jobs, get a better education, and escape segregation. In the past, they travelled to New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit and other cities in the north to find work. Today, a lot of people are heading out west to places like Los Angeles. This kind of movement of people from one place to another is called a migration. September 30th At dinner, Daddy told us that he had been asking our neighbours what they know about living and working in places like California. He found out that last year, President Franklin Roosevelt signed a special order. It said companies that manufacture equipment for the military cannot practice discrimination. That means they can't refuse to hire workers because of their race or ethnicity. Most factories that make those kind of products are out west. You don't find them here in the south. 
That's why Uncle Eugene was able to get a factory job in California, even though it's impossible for black people to get that kind of work here. I tried to picture what it might be like to live in a place where Negroes have more freedom, where people like me could apply for any job they wanted. Maybe I didn't have to live on small farms all my life. Maybe one day I could move somewhere else and do other kinds of work when I grow up. October 5th. Harvest time is finally here, and our crop of cotton is ready to be picked. It's Monday, and we should have spent the day in school, but Mary, Buck and I took today off to help Daddy and Mama on the farm. We spent all day in the field picking bowls, which are thick, fluffy parts of cotton plants. We picked for hours and hours until our fingers ached, but sadly we didn't have much to show for it. Boll weevils had attacked our crop. These tiny bugs are pests that lay eggs in cotton plants. When the young insects hatch, they eat parts of the plant. Boll weevils are a problem every year, but this time there were so many that most of the crop was ruined. At the end of the day, as we walked back to the house, I saw Daddy give Mama a look. I knew they were thinking about all of the money that we owe Mr Greenfield, and I knew we have no way to pay it. October 10th Tonight, as we sat down to dinner, I got the surprise of my life. We're moving! Daddy and Mama told us that we're leaving Mississippi and going to live in Los Angeles, California. Daddy wrote Uncle Eugene for his help finding work. We're going to sell our furniture and other things to pay some of the money we owe Mr Greenfield and to buy tickets for the long train trip out west. Daddy says we'll be able to live a better life in California, partly because factory workers there make much more money than sharecroppers do here. Also, Mama says there are no Jim Crow laws in California, so we'll have so much more freedom. I don't want to leave Eve and my other friends, though, because I may never see them again. Also, I have only ever lived in Mississippi, I've never even visited another state. What if I hate California? What if no one likes me and I can't make any friends? October 21st. This morning, I stood with my family on the platform of the railroad station near our town. I had a train ticket tucked inside my journal, which I clutched tightly in my arm. I didn't want to take any chance that the ticket might slip through my fingers because we didn't have enough money to buy another one. Daddy, Mama, Mary and Buck had their tickets too, and we each had a small bag for our clothes and a few remaining belongings. We had sold most of what we owned, and it was strange to think that everything we had in the world now was fit into those five bags. When a whistle sounded, I could see a train approaching the station. It blew a thick column of smoke as it rolled down the track, closer and closer to us. Other passengers began to crowd around. The train slowed to a stop. The doors opened, and we all climbed on board. Negro passengers had to sit in the Jim Crow car. It was separate from the rest of the train, where white passengers sat. We couldn't leave that one car not even to go to the dining car to get a meal. Lucky for us, Mama had thought to pack food in brown paper bags for us to eat along the way. As the whistle sounded again, the train slowly pulled out of the station, and we were on our way to California. October 22nd. I'm trying to write, but the seats of the train are shaking as we speed down the track, so I'll keep this short. At New Orleans, we switched trains to board the Southern Pacific Railroad. We still have a long way to go, and it will take us a few more days to reach Los Angeles. Daddy says the entire trip is more than 2,000 miles. Looking out the window, I watch the countryside go by and see farm field after farm field. It reminds me of everything that we are leaving behind. I wonder what we will see when we arrive in California. We're from a tiny town in Mississippi, one with only a thousand people, 
but there are millions of people living in Los Angeles. Will such a big city ever feel like home? October 25th. We arrived in Los Angeles this morning. As I stepped off the train, the first thing I noticed was the air. Mississippi is still hot this time of year. California is warm as well, but the air is not as thick and heavy as it is in the south. We took a bus from the station to Uncle Eugene's apartment building. Los Angeles looks really different from Mississippi. This is a big city with houses, offices and other buildings spread out all over. Palm trees line the streets. I'd never seen a palm tree before. And the roads are packed with cars, buses and trucks. Sitting on the bus, I wanted to cover my ears to block out all the noise from the cars, buses, trucks and their horns. It was so different from the quiet fields and dirt roads that I know from home. I sighed, realising that getting used to this new place will take a while. November 2nd Uncle Eugene helped Daddy and Mama both find jobs at the airport factory and they started today. They're working on assembly lines, putting plane engines together, one part at a time. Mama told us that they would be making a lot more money than they did as sharecroppers. Uncle Eugene has been so good to us. He's letting us stay in his apartment and has been helping us look for a place of our own. Mama and Daddy think they found a place in an apartment building not far from where we are now. As soon as they pay the first month's rent and sign some papers, we'll be packing our things and moving in. November 9th Today was the first day at my new school, and it is such a big change from Mississippi. This elementary school is integrated, which means that white and black children attend together. We sit in the same classrooms, side by side, and no one thinks anything of it. I sit next to a white girl named Sally, who reminds me a little of Eve. They both wear their hair in braided pigtails, just like me. I hope, as Sally and I get to know each other, we can become friends too. One great thing about my new school is that I have my own textbooks now, and I don't have to share with anyone. No more walking to and from school either. I take a bus now, and it's just a short ride. The next time it rains, I won't have to worry about getting soaked on the way home. I'm also getting used to the noise from the busy city streets. It doesn't bother me so much anymore, and California is beginning to feel like home. November 15th We moved into our new apartment today, and it's bigger than the house we had in Mississippi. There are two bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, a dining room, and a bathroom. Mostly white residents live in this neighbourhood, and we will be one of the few Negro families. Not everyone was welcoming when we arrived. A white mother and son were standing on the sidewalk as Mama and I carried a couple of our bags into the building. The mother frowned at us like Mr Greenfield used to. Then the son stuck out his tongue and spit on the ground near our feet. Mama put an arm around me and hurried us both inside. As we climbed the three flights to our apartment, she said, Even though things are different here, some things will still be the same. We will have to face them the best that we can. I nodded to show her that I understood. The idea that discrimination wasn't only in the South made me sad, but I felt better when I saw my new bedroom. I still had to share it with Mary and Buck, but it was bigger than our old room, and it had a set of bunk beds. Buck was too scared to sleep on the top bed, and Mary didn't care. I took the top bunk, and I love it already. I decided to keep this journal tucked underneath my new mattress, where no one will find it. November 20th. Today was a special day. I went to a library for the first time. I have to write a current events report for school, so my new friend Sally said we should go to the library to look through newspapers for research. My mouth dropped open when she made the suggestion. I almost said that Negroes aren't allowed to go to the library, but then I remembered that things are different in California. After school, Sally and I walked to a library that was a few blocks away. 
When I stepped inside, I stopped and stared in amazement. I had never seen so many books in one place. Everywhere I looked, there were shelves and shelves filled with books. The shelves stretched up to the ceiling and were so high that ladders leaned against them, so the librarians could climb up to the top shelves. Even though there's no segregation, there weren't many other Negroes at the library. That's probably because mostly white people live and work in this community. The librarian who greeted us at the front desk looked a little surprised to see me walk in. I felt uncomfortable at first and worried that she might frown like Mr Greenfield and some of my white neighbours do. But the librarian broke into a smile and asked us what we needed. She helped us find just the right articles for our report. November 26th. It's Thanksgiving Day, so we all have the day off. Last night, Daddy brought home a surprise, a radio. We've never had a radio of our own. This morning, we listened to news about the war. Daddy and Mama are proud that their work helps the soldiers. The money they make helps us too. We have a nice home, and we don't have to worry about Mr Greenfield or Boll Weevils anymore. I should stop writing and help with Thanksgiving dinner. Uncle Eugene is on his way over. So is another Negro family who moved into the building. Like us, the Johnsons left the segregated South to find a better life in the West. It's funny that this time last year, all of us were living thousands of miles away. Not everything is perfect in Los Angeles. Sometimes white people are friendly to us, and sometimes they aren't. It's hard not knowing what to expect, but this is our home now. And at the moment, I can't think of anywhere that I would rather be.